Can he preach? Can he preach? Finding the right man for the job. We're in the process of seeking out a minister to join our full-time staff. We will in this process invariably see and hear various men come here to, uh, you know, to teach a class, to uh, preach a sermon. And aside from uh, the, his marital status and his training and experience, is there anything else that we're looking for in finding the right a candidate. I believe that a number, the number one priority should be that we want someone who can preach well. Our main interaction with this person will be when we sit in his class or we hear him preach on Sunday. And aside from him being you know, easy to get along with and maybe have a good sense of humor, uh, the bottom line is, will he be able to feed us spiritually from God's word? That, that's, the, that's the bottom line. Because in the end, we'll not be supporting him to be kind. We're not going to be supporting a man uh, to be funny or even to be a good man or a faithful husband and father. Although these things are requirements for all Christian men, but no, that's not what we're looking for. It's not what we're paying for. We will be hiring him based on his ability to handle the word of God correctly and to lift us up spiritually and to keep us faithful to Christ by his encouragement and his admonishment and his instruction from God's word. That's what we want. We, we, we want a preacher who motivates us to invite friends and family to worship knowing that they will be edified and challenged by the message uh, that they hear. That's what we need. That's what all churches need. Preachers who know how to preach. With this in mind, I thought it would be helpful if we examined the model for all preachers to see what kind of things we should be looking for in a minister as we go through this process. If you haven't already guessed, the model I'm referring to is the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, and more specifically, uh, his ability and style of preaching. And hopefully this will guide us as we search for a man uh, suitable to serve here at the Choctaw congregation. Uh, and who will, along with Marty and Titus, spend a good amount of his time teaching and, and preaching to us from this, uh, from this very pulpit. Now, whether you call yourself an evangelist or a missionary or a preacher, the one thing that binds ministers in the service of the Lord is the common task of preaching. Uh, preachers always have opinions on preaching or styles of preaching or what is required for a good sermon. You put two preachers together and ministers will be discussing and sharing favorite sermons and ideas uh, or opinions concerning the central role in, in, our, in our ministry. So it's in this spirit, therefore, that I offer this lesson this morning on preaching. That in one way or another, all preachers try to emulate the preaching of Jesus himself. Perhaps in examining Jesus's style and his approach to this glorious work, we can gain insight into what we are looking for in a new minister here in Choctaw, because if you're sitting there and there's a guy who comes, his name is Joe Smith or whatever, and he's preaching, you're listening to him, but do you know what you're looking for? Do you understand the difference between something that is, yeah, we got to get this guy, or nah, maybe we should pass on this guy. We started at the beginning a little bit about the, the, uh, the, the history of preaching. Preaching is one of the most ancient of ministries. Peter refers to Noah as a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2.5, and the Old Testament was recorded mainly by those who were involved in the work of preaching. Prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Amos and others were essentially the preachers of that time who also possessed the gift of prophecy. Much of what we read in their books are their sermons and their exhortations to kings and to people of that period. Even Solomon refers to himself as the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
In the New Testament, John the Baptist is called a prophet, but his main work was accomplished through the ministry of preaching. And so from John through Jesus to the apostles, we can trace this ministry as the main component in God's effort to communicate his will and his promises and his love to mankind. And it's the key ministry in the work of building the kingdom of God here on earth. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It's an important ministry because it's the one ministry that God uses to do his work. As a ministry type, it's a gift. It's a role given only to some by the Holy Spirit through Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some as evangelists. From the very beginning, God has used preachers as his mouthpiece. It is fitting therefore that Jesus makes his appearance on this earth, not as a priest, although he is our perfect high priest, Hebrews 10.21, and he made his appearance here on this earth, not as a lawyer, although with his sacrifice he enters into the presence of God as our advocate of mercy, Hebrews 10 verses one to four. Mm -mm. No, he comes to earth as a preacher, communicating perfectly and completely God's final will for all mankind. The Hebrew writer refers to this at the very beginning of his epistle in chapter one, verses one and two, he says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions, in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And so as I mentioned before, the prophets were preachers, blessed with the special gift of inspiration, and their preaching came directly from the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. However, not all preachers were inspired uh, prophets. The word preach or preaching uh, comes from the Greek word, which almost always meant the proclaiming of the good news concerning Jesus. In the Old Testament, the word referred to one who brought any message at all that cheered the hearers, 1 Samuel 31, 9. But by the New Testament times, the word preacher became exclusively connected with the heralding of the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now in the New Testament, we have several models of modern day preachers. They were not divinely inspired they were not chosen directly by Jesus as the apostles were, but nevertheless, they served as God's proclaimers of the good news. These men were chosen and ordained by the church. They were trained by human teachers and they preached the message already recorded by the prophets and the apostles before them, just as preachers do today. Now there are many whose identity we do not know, but the New Testament does name a few of these preachers like Stephen or Philip, Timothy and Titus as some of the more familiar ones. Jesus therefore was one of these. He was a preacher. He worked as an itinerant preacher announcing the good news of the kingdom throughout Israel. He was empowered and inspired as the son of God, but he served his people as a preacher and as a teacher. And that's what we're looking for, a preacher and a teacher. Now, in order to discuss the preaching of Jesus, we must first understand the mechanics of his work so that we can better appreciate what and how well Jesus preached. Preaching has three major components. First, effective communication. You want to be a preacher, you've got to be able to connect with people. The principles that apply in every form of public communication apply to preaching as well. The rules about posture and voice and inflection, gestures, eye contact, 
uh, that make a person a good public speaker are also necessary to produce a good preacher. In some cases, someone may have fantastic memory for history, but turns out to be a boring professor because his voice is flat. Did you ever have that at school? A teacher or a professor who knew everything, knew his stuff, but was just boring as dry paint, right? Why? Well, maybe his voice was flat. Everything was in this tone. It never changed all the way. You know, it was always the same old thing or he or she never made eye contact with students, or they weren't enthusiastic about the material. Well, the same is true for preachers. Many are good, holy, knowledgeable men, but many are also poor communicators, so they're not effective as preachers and teachers. Jesus, however, was a dynamic and effective communicator in every situation. Of course, he had great power and resources, but he knew how and when to use them. For example, he never lost his composure when debating the Pharisees as they tried to provoke and discredit him. Matthew chapter 12, verse one and following. You know, when they were questioning him about breaking the Sabbath. On the other hand, he could galvanize a huge crowd. Matthew 4, verse 25, multitudes followed him from city to city or he could teach a small group of specially chosen disciples, Matthew chapter five, verse one. He knew how to speak on, uh, to, the, to the ill. Uh, he knew how to speak to the outcast and to those who were discouraged, Matthew eight and nine. He could speak to the demoniac and the paralytic. He communicated just as effectively with religious leaders you know, the synagogue ruler in Matthew 9, 18, or to the pagans, the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15, 21. He could also speak to rulers, Sadducees and Pilate, for example, Matthew 22 and three. Or he could connect with children, Matthew 19, 13, and do all things well. Some say that uh, Ronald Reagan, the uh, former American president, was the great communicator because of his effective use of the media. And this may be so, but the greatest communicator was Jesus Christ, because he could always connect his, with his message, whether it be a message of comfort or a stinging rebuke or the good news of the kingdom. He could reach out to groups or individuals. He could speak at the temple or on a hillside. Everyone, everywhere was connected when he was the one addressing them. Of course, not everyone liked what he said and not everyone believed what he said, but everyone knew and remembered what he said. That's the mark of a true communicator. In Matthew 27, 63, uh, the chief priests and Pharisees actually quote a portion of Jesus' sermon concerning his resurrection in an effort to get Pilate to put extra guards at his tomb. The fact that even Jesus' enemies quoted him accurately demonstrates how effectively he was able to communicate. Man, when your enemies remember what you say, then you're doing a good job. Now, most sermons fall into three main categories. And much of the training that preachers receive involve uh, learning how to develop lessons within these frameworks. I mention this because uh, Jesus used this. First type is the textual sermon. These are lessons based on one text in the Bible. They're called textual because most of the points or lessons are drawn directly from that one text. For example, a sermon that is based on the parable of the prodigal son will usually remain with that one text in Luke 15, and, and, and the conclusions, the comparisons, uh, and the practical applications will all stem directly from the story of the lost son. Titus's, our Titus, by the way, Titus's sermon last Sunday night was a good example of a textual uh, sermon on uh, 2 Peter 1, verses five to eight, and he stayed in the text he explained the text, he drew all of his lessons from that one text. That's a textual sermon. Another kind of sermon is a topical sermon. 
These sermons take a certain topic, whether it be a baptism or the promise of heaven or dealing with anger, whatever, and attempt to summarize what the Bible has to say about these things. Here, the preacher begins with a single idea or topic and he will develop a body of biblical information concerning that subject. The topical sermon is the most common form of sermons. And then there's what's called an expository sermon. An expository sermon is much like a textual sermon except that the preacher is focusing on the meaning of a particular passage. He will do this by explaining the meaning of the words in their original languages, or he'll give background information on the historical, social conditions of that time in order to help his audience understand the passage in context. It is for this reason that teaching the book of Revelation, for example, requires much exposition. Why? because the symbols and the language are not as readily familiar as the language found in the parable of the prodigal son, for example. Therefore, much more background development is necessary. In the end, expository preaching seeks to find the essential meaning of the passage for the original people to whom it was first addressed. In other words, how it fits in the section of the Bible where it is placed and then how it relates to the entire scripture, and then finally, if there are applications that can be made for a modern day audience. Because of all these requirements, the expository sermon is the most difficult sermon uh, uh, to prepare. Now, there are other, you know, I could go on and on here. Uh, there are other subcategory of sermon types. There's the biographical sermon about you know, individual people. There's the geographical sermon. You can actually preach a sermon about the geography of the Bible lands. Uh, word studies, a sermon that takes a single word and develops a lesson around the study of that one word, like uh, the word sanctification, for example, or the word uh, propitiation, uh, different Bible words, uh, developing a whole lesson based on a single word. But textual, topical, and expository sermons, these are the mainstay of every preacher's lessons. Okay, uh, I had to give you a little bit of technical background here to understand what I'm going to say about Jesus. So what about Jesus' preaching style? Even though we can categorize some common approaches to modern biblical preaching, it becomes evident when looking at Jesus' preaching style that these categories are limited. Let's face it, Jesus used every style and in some instances he blended styles in the same lesson. Now I say this to establish the fact that any attempt to fit his preaching into a box is futile because his is the preaching that our preaching is based on. But for the purpose of this lesson, I'd like to demonstrate some of the methods that Jesus used, which are recorded in the New Testament, very quickly. How about textual preaching? It's hard to discuss Jesus' textual sermons because he created the texts in the New Testament from which we today preach. So it's pretty hard to <laughs> give an opinion about his uh, textual uh, sermons. At times, however, he did textual sermons based on his own texts. For example, in the parable of the sower and the seed in Matthew 13, Jesus begins with a parable as a basic text, and then he follows this with a textual sermon explaining to his apostles why he used parables and what this particular parable meant. Truly amazing, an original text, the parable of the sower and the seed, and then a little later on, Jesus preaches or teaches a textual sermon on the text that he's just created. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, topical preaching. Much of the Lord's preaching dealt with various topics relevant to the people that he spoke to. The topics were based on who he was uh, dealing with at the time. So uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, for example, in Matthews five to seven, uh, deals with the topic of character, the kind of character 
a person finds in the kingdom of those who are Christians. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. Uh, further along, there's a lesson for the apostles on the topic of true discipleship, Matthew 10, five to 42. The list goes on and on as Jesus clarifies and refocuses the true meaning of existing teaching in the, um, in the scriptures at that time. And he provides new revelation from God. Whatever topic we preach on today, Jesus has either revealed it, confirmed it, or clarified it for us 2000 years ago. And then you have expository preaching. Although many preachers think that this is the only type of preaching that should be done, it was the one least used by the Lord. The people Jesus addressed, they understood the language, so there was no need to translate or to explain the root meaning of the words. In addition to this, the people he taught were familiar with the social and the historical settings, which we today have to recreate with study and research. Jesus' listeners, they could catch every voice intonation, every gesture, which is so important to effective communication. And so for this reason, there was less need for Jesus to explain history or the meaning of the word in Greek or in, or, or in Hebrew and so on and so forth. They already spoke the language. The Lord did do some expository work, but mainly in dealing with the Pharisees. There were many confrontations where he explained or clarified certain passages or conclusions that they had misunderstood or they had misrepresented. For example, in Matthew 12, three to seven, he explains an exception to the rule of eating the showbread by the priests when David ate the showbread out of need. In Matthew 15, one to 14, he explains how the Pharisees have misapplied the law of Korban by denying their parents' financial support. In Matthew 19, one to 12, he explains the proper interpretation and application of the law concerning marriage and divorce. In Matthew 22, 29 to 33, he corrected the Sadducees' false conclusion concerning the resurrection based on their mistaken use of the verb am in the Old Testament a reference. I could go on and on, but those are just some examples of Jesus' expository work in correcting uh, the scriptures for his, uh, his hearers, excuse me. Now, as I said, more, there are more examples of this, but these amply demonstrate Jesus' absolute grasp of the scriptures and his ability to explain every verse perfectly within the context of the entire Bible. And why not? Why not have the perfect style? Is he not the word made flesh? John 1, uh, uh, 1 to 13. Jesus knew how to use the word and communicate it because it was and is the product of his spirit and his mind and his knowledge and his power. And then one other point I want to make here is relevancy. You know, there's the question of relevancy. Preaching professors uh, call this the so what factor. Is what you are preaching meaningful? Can it be used? Is there a point to all of it? You're probably wondering when I'm going to get to the point of this one, and I will, you'll see in a moment. But in order for preaching to have a point and to be relevant, it has to have specific, specific objectives. There are any number of preaching objectives, but most are variations on the following seven. You understand what I'm saying? A guy can be doing a topical sermon or an expository sermon, but what is he getting at? What's the objective? What's he trying to accomplish? And, and believe it or not, there are common preaching objectives that all preachers learn uh, to, to work with. Here are the seven. First is the evangelistic objective. This objective is to call on the church to reach out. In other words, a sermon on the need to be evangelistic, how we are saved, and how we can encourage others to be saved. 
That's the evangelistic objective. The second one is the devotional objective. In other words, the lesson here, no matter if it's topical, textual, whatever it is, the objective is to inspire awe and reverence for God. Sermons on God's power and God's grace, these are devotional uh, objective sermons. The third objective, the ethical objective. The objective here is to teach right from wrong, to explain and encourage correct behavior and what holy living is like, as well as lessons that motivate the hearers to greater love, to greater holiness. That's the objective of the lesson. The fourth is the consecrative objective. In other words, to consecrate means to set aside or to devote oneself. The goal in these kinds of sermons is to exhort the church to greater commitment. For example, lessons on discipleship or personal sacrifice fall into this category. If you've preached the successful sermon with an objective that is consecrative, the, the members of the church will leave saying, I can do better, I can try harder, I, I've seen something that I want to aspire to in my private personal life. If that's what the church is thinking when they leave after hearing uh, the sermon, then the sermon objective has been reached. The next one is the doctrinal objective. The objective here is to find out what does the Bible say? or what does the Bible command or teach or demonstrate or forbid in various areas of life and conduct? We need to know that. We need to know what is right and what is wrong, uh, what is higher and what is lower. Uh, and when somebody leaves uh, thinking, you know what, this thing over here that I was doing all this time, I thought I was doing okay, it's not. The Bible says not to do that. Uh, again, the objective has been reached. Then there's the supportive uh, objective. The supportive objective is uh, encouragement. Encouragement in suffering. Uh, all of us suffer, sometimes we don't suffer all at the same time. Uh, but take a group of 200 to 300 people on any given day and for sure there, there's a, a, a large number of those people that are suffering emotionally or physically uh, or socially or spiritually. Well, the supportive objective of the lesson of that day is to encourage people uh, in, that, uh, in that particular situation. And then there's the faith objective. Preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in order to produce faith unto salvation. Also, preaching Christ-centered sermons in order to deepen our knowledge of and our love for and our adoration for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we ever leave thinking, oh God, I love you so much? Do we ever stop in the middle of a lesson and say to ourselves, I'm not worthy of you, Jesus. I, I've seen you in such a way, Lord, that I've never seen you before. Because if that's what you're thinking, when the preacher is preaching, he's reaching his objective. He clearly wanted to lift the congregation's uh, uh, notion and understanding of how, how wonderful, how deep, uh, how high, how great uh, is the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so preachers who can preach have to constantly mix all of these variables in order to provide a balanced spiritual diet. And this means preaching from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, as well as changing their approach from topical to textual to expository, and then making sure that they have clear preaching objectives in every lesson. If your objective is just to have a sermon, you don't have a preaching objective. If your objective is to fill 30 minutes, you don't have a preaching objective. This is why preaching gets boring at times. Some preachers simply repeat what the Bible says superficially without making a point, without explaining context, without providing a deeper meaning or making practical applications for a person's life. 
Some preachers get locked into one style or they pound away at the same objective week after week after week without even realizing it. Usually members start saying, well, it's the same old thing every week. Now the sermon is different, but the style and the objective never change. I, I, I remember this is a while, but I won't mention the name here, uh, but I remember, uh, and this wasn't here, this is another, another congregation. I remember one preacher who ended up condemning the use of instruments in worship, in public worship, no matter what text he began with in his lesson. So every week his title and text were different, but his point was always the same, no instruments in public worship. And I mean, I, I would be sitting there and in my mind I was saying, I get it, I get it, I understand. <laughs> Can we have something different, please? You know, after a while, the church knows if the preacher is making an effort in preparing meaningful, well-prepared sermons that truly edify and challenge and comfort them. They know. You don't have to know all the mechanics here that I've just explained to you to know the difference between a good sermon and not such a good one. Jesus, of course, had no such problem. He covered every objective using various approaches. One can readily find all the preaching objectives listed above, or listed that what I've told you. You can find all of these objectives in his Matthew sermons alone. Never mind searching for his other material, just go through his sermons in Matthew and you'll find all of the objectives. And I'll give you just a little sample here. In uh, Matthew 28, 18, go therefore and make disciples. What objective is that? Well, evangelistic. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it shall be given. What is that? Devotional objective. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers. What is that? Ethical objective. Matthew 10, 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Consecrational objective. Matthew 19, 6, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. What is that? Doctrinal, ethical objective. Matthew 25, 28, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. What objective is that? Supportive objective. And Matthew 26, 26, take, eat, this is my body. What objective is that? The faith uh, 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 objective. And so uh, Jesus uh, not only preached about these objectives, his entire life was lived in such a way that these objectives are now possible for us to preach about. His very life was a sermon, uh, a sermon that reflected every style and achieved every objective. Okay, summary number one, my notes say summary number one. <laughs> In closing out this lesson, I'd like to briefly examine one passage in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 5, verse 1, where Jesus demonstrates his amazing ability to mix and attain various preaching objectives within one simple style. In this section, Jesus gives his disciples an overview of what Christian life and kingdom living is like and how different it is to the life that they are experiencing in the world. And so the style or the approach of Jesus' lesson here is clearly topical as he addresses a variety of issues and subjects relevant to the kingdom and its nature. What is amazing about this sermon, however, is that it achieves so many objectives within one lesson. For I'll just give you a couple. For example, the Beatitudes accomplish the supportive objective in encouraging the hearers, despite the difficulty of uh, kingdom living, blessed are those who mourn, for they uh, shall be comforted. The uh, discussion of the salt and light promotes the ethical lifestyle required in the kingdom. You know, let your light shine, five, six. And then when Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, here he is clarifying doctrinal issues that had been misinterpreted. And so the list of objectives reached go on and on as he works his way through the lesson. Jesus used every style, he reached every objective, and while he taught in person, he established many of the texts that we preachers preach from today. There's no end to what can be said about Jesus's preaching and teaching, 
only that it will be our inexhaustive model until he returns. Now my notes say summary number two. The question we now have is how do we use this information that I've given you in selecting a new minister? Well, I'm not saying that those who try out should be doing everything that Jesus was doing. That would be nice. But after all, we're only men and sinful men at that. Even those who preach have a weak flesh to contend with. However, here are some things to consider when you're listening, when you're paying attention, when you're examining. Number one, look to see if they're using a preaching type. You know, is it topical, textual, expository? Listen for spiritual objectives. How well prepared is he? Does his sermon look like he spent time in study and preparation? That's one factor to consider when you're considering hiring somebody. Number two, have you learned something? Do you have a better insight into a spiritual matter? Has your faith been strengthened or do you feel comforted and more confident after he's finished? Of course, if he's brave enough, has he challenged your faith? Has he convicted you of sin or lack of devotion? Or has he simply repeated what you already know and you've heard before? What's the point? If all the preacher can do is tell you what you already know, what's the point? And then thirdly, is there any fire in the belly? Is there any fire in the belly? Does he believe in what he is saying? Is there any urgency? Is there any enthusiasm? Is there some conviction in his manner and in his voice? In other words, can he preach? Believe me, you'll know it when you see it. How many times have I sat there listening to people for whatever reasons, whether it's like a summer series or we're interviewing for people and you know, blah, blah, blah. One guy gets up, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden somebody gets up and does something and you, you, you look up and say, man, that guy can preach, right? You don't have to have gone to preaching school to know that. If you've been in church at all, if you've been to church services for a couple of years, you know it when you see it, that guy can preach, or man, we got to get that guy. Never mind how much it costs, that's the guy. You'll know it. He's got fire in the belly. On the other hand, if your response to his lesson or his sermon is, well, that was nice. He sure has a lovely voice. And you know, what a sense of humor. Well then, if that's what you're saying, then add him as a friend on your Facebook page, but don't hire him as a preacher because nice and funny cannot replace or make up for real preaching. What I'm saying to you, pay attention and let the information that I've shared with you this morning guide you in your decision making. It's important, it's important. Don't just go, yeah, let's get that guy, let's get the process over with. We've been looking now for a couple of months, you know, let's get it over with, you hire that guy, why not? You know, he was funny, I remember him telling a joke. Don't do that, because you're gonna have to live with him for a long time after that. It's a lot, it's a lot easier hiring a preacher than getting rid of one. Speaking of decisions, if you've made the decision to become a disciple of Jesus, maybe not because you heard this lesson, just you've been thinking about it. You've been studying with someone and you've decided I need to become a disciple of Jesus. Yeah, I, I need to confess his name and repent of my sins. I, I should be baptized. Then if you've made that decision, then this morning I encourage you to come forward 
in order to make the good confession of faith before the, uh, before the brethren this morning and do that, become a Christian. Don't, don't let the fact that I've preached a, a very particular sermon about hiring preachers, don't let that stop you <laughs> from coming forward and confessing Christ yourself. And if during this lesson, you've had the desire to be better, to give yourself more perfectly to Christ, to devote more of yourself to his service, and you would like the prayers of the church to help you live your best life for Christ starting today, then of course, come forward now and let us pray that God strengthens you to do all that you desire uh, in his glory. Don't let another Sunday go by without doing that. And I say that because you might go out yeah, you might die, but you know what? Something may happen to just change your mind, get your attention, throw you off course. So if you have it in your heart that you want to be better for Christ, don't be afraid. Don't be too proud. Come, come and uh, we'll pray for you or we'll baptize you or we'll do whatever you need so that you can become a better Christian. Shall we do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement?